Welcome to a place of wellness and healing for both your body and mind. Get ready to live a happy, healthy, energized life that totally rocks. You're listening to Straight Talking Natural Health, a no BS podcast for busy people who want to ditch the fatigue, find balance and feel great with your host and naturopath, Jules Galloway. Today's guest is in a niche that I think is actually about to explode. She works with helping people to reset their nervous systems via a little friend of ours called the vagus nerve. Now, many of you have probably heard of the vagus nerve. It's starting to turn up in the usual places online like PubMed, blogs, Instagram posts and YouTube videos. But do you really know all the things that it does and how to reset or rewire it if something goes wrong? Well, by today, the end of today's podcast, you'll know so much more, including why it's so important to address the vagus nerve in people with a history of stress, pain, trauma, inflammation, and chronic health conditions. So enter today's guest. We first connected in Byron Bay when she rented a room in my clinic. She's a physiotherapist with postgraduate studies in clinical mindfulness, trauma-sensitive biofeedback, polyvagal theory, and the use of transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation. Oh, my God. She's learned learned from pain researchers, professors in neuroplasticity, neuroscientists, and psychologists on how to the brain and the nervous system change from stress, trauma, and all of this leading into chronic pain. So she's the perfect person to lead us down the vagus nerve rabbit hole. Woohoo! Please welcome to the show the amazing Jessica McGuire. Yay! Hello. Hi, Jules. Thank you for such a beautiful intro. People always start giggling halfway through my intros. It's so funny. I could hear you. I was like, shut up. (laughs) Sorry. No, I love it. I think it's part of my goal now is to just make people start laughing halfway through the intro. It's like job done. Yes, you succeeded for sure. Yes. <laughs> so, Jess, tell me because you you are my go to Vegas queen. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, tell us, like, give us a bit of a lowdown to start with. Like, what is this Vegas nerve, and what does it do, and why is it so? Like, why is it starting to become something that we're all talking about? Sure, it's a great question. So. It's a really interesting um, thing because when you sometimes talk about the vagus nerve at first, people think it's sort of like a, a bit of a strange thing, like it's your aura or something. That's where I've noticed when it first gets introduced. But it's actually one of our cranial nerves. So it's a 10th cranial nerve. And it runs from our brain stem. So if you were to put a hand on the back of your skull and then there's a branch or there's several branches to it, but one of the main ones runs to our heart. Yeah. And this helps to really slow our physiology back down. So when we've had a stressful experience, we often feel lots of activation or mobilizing energy in our chest and our heart might beat faster. So it's the vagal break that helps us slow that back down. And then we also have another branch that goes, or branches, I should say, that go down to our, under our diaphragm and touches almost every organ on the way, but mainly it comes down to the digestive system. So there's a lot of its role in our digestive health. And then there's another branch as well that runs from the heart and it involves the muscles of communication and speech. So it travels upwards through the throat to the ears and it connects to other cranial nerves around the face. So we call this our social engagement system. And by understanding its anatomy, we really can understand its function of what it does. So it's involved with helping us when we're anxious to calm back down. It's involved with physical health. So regulation of our organs, um, particularly the heart, the lungs and the digestive system. And then it's also very important in our relational health. And just one other job. It's got a lot of things it does. It does everything, this one. (laughs) It does, doesn't it? So 80% of its fibres 
run from the body, particularly the, those organs, up to the brain. And we, it's, it does a job of what we call interoception, which is we could say that's our eighth sensory system and it detects, it helps us to detect and understand physical sensations inside of our body. But some of these processes are also happening outside of our conscious awareness but that information gets relayed up to our brain and then the fibres of the vagus nerve that run back down into our body change our system. So rather than thinking about it as one nerve, it's a little bit more helpful to think of it as a series of connections and this continual feedback loop running from our body up to the brain and then coming back down again to keep what we call homeostasis or a set point or a balance in our body. It's kind of like its own little ecosystem. Absolutely. Yep, it totally is. And it's communicating with the enteric nervous system in our gut. And we know that that can actually operate even if that's separate from or cut off from the brain. So it is. It's, it's, it's really communicating between a lot of those systems um, and I just love this because I think we learned a lot that so much of these systems are apparently separate, but it's not possible to separate this body or the body from the brain. And it really brings to question, you know, what do we label as mental health? What do we label as physical health, emotional health? So it's, it's really looking at a whole person, which I think is important um, especially for, you know, as health professionals, if we want to help our clients or patients the best we can. Yeah. So, oh, God, there's so much to unpack, but it just, it's it sounds like it's connecting things in a way that we didn't realise or that I think natural medicine was onto it, but we didn't know the science behind it. It's like how we used to kind of know about microbiomes but we didn't have a name for the microbiome and now it sounds like now there's a bit of science coming out to show what this this whole system does yes yeah the, the, the main work i think we can look at is what has been done by stephen porges with creating polyvagal theory and that's just been a profound framework to look at understanding how chronic and traumatic stress impacts our health, but also how the body speaks to the brain. Yeah. How do you how do you say his name again, Stephen? Porges. So P-O-R-G-E-S. Cool, because I know people are gonna ask. <laughs> <laughs> They're on the Google right now. Yeah. <laughs> So, so why are we suddenly hearing so much about the vagus nerve? Like, mm. like is it because of, of Stephen's work or is there, is there something else going on? It's a good question. I, I think a lot of it is there's probably a realisation that we need to look at more than just reframing our thoughts if we want to, you know, feel less anxious and, there's more to it than just looking at things as, you know, these are my thoughts, therefore I feel this way. And I think what people are realising is they want to work with things that have happened in their past, like previous chronic and traumatic stress, to improve how they can be in the present moment. And that education has been coming through around how a lot of the changes that happen to our what we call our autonomic nervous system, so the nervous system that detects threat, um, is really what can move people into prolonged states of anxiety or prolonged states of shutdown, apathy or depression or have people swinging between the two. Um, and I think it's great that this education is coming out there so people understand that a lot of this is because of their biology it's not that they're weak-willed there's something wrong with them there's a, a profound influence from particularly the health of the vagus nerve so when we look at what we said with the autonomic nervous system the vagus nerve makes up most of our parasympathetic nervous system so 
we used to just very simply look at this autonomic nervous system as having a, like a, a, an accelerator and a brake. So our sympathetic nervous system mobilizes our system. When we're stressed, we take action um, and we feel, you know, the things like a heart beating faster. But then afterwards, we apply the brake through our parasympathetic nervous system. So we once thought it was quite simple um, and it was even explained as being separate from the brain, like it was like the peripheral nervous system rather than the central nervous system, which comprises of the brain and spinal cord. Yeah. But this is, it's far too simple and it doesn't give rise to the third, the other state that some people move into following chronic and traumatic stress. And that's a state of that shutdown, freeze, apathy and burnout, which we see a lot of for people who've gone through um, periods of, of chronic stress. So it's the, the knowledge from Stephen Porges coming out on polyvagal theory has given rise to this new lens that we can look at not just the different states of our nervous system. So we can look at it as having the sympathetic system, which mobilizes us to take action. But if we get stuck there, we may feel anxious, agitated, hypervigilant. We can see things like insomnia, digestive issues, tension, pain, inflammation. And then when we can move into this regulated state where the vagus nerve is working well, you know, we're not always calm and that's definitely not how we're designed to be. We can, we can still have ups and downs in our physiology, but overall we feel that we can be flexible, adaptable, our thoughts are coherent and our energy is relatively stable. But then that third state that we can drop down into is from a part of the vagus nerve called the dorsal vagal branch. And that can take us into that freeze, shutdown, feeling quite like we want to withdraw and isolate from people. And again, this has its own range of effects. Um, we may find ourselves moving into extreme procrastination. We feel foggy. We can't take action. And, you know, for so long, I think people have blamed themselves for being weak-wheeled, not having the motivation, when a lot of these changes are physiological. And for me, I think that being able to look at behaviours through the lens of the nervous system is so empowering for people. And yeah, that's where what I love to teach to um, students who participate in our programs and masterclasses. Yeah. Wow. That whole, you've just blown that whole sympathetic system, parasympathetic system, nervous system thing right out of the water. It just made it look very two dimensional. Um, all the stuff that we learned in college about, you know, the, the one is fight and flight and the other one is rest and digest. And we were like, okay, we've learned about those now. Let's move on. Uh, don't think we did enough no, to learn all no. of the intricacies. I think so too. And what I probably found was the biggest realisation was being taught that that autonomic system was separate from the central nervous system when it's not. Like you can see that the, the fibres of the vagus nerve they're originating in the brainstem, but they're actually, they have connections that go up to higher centers in the brain too. So we, to separate the central nervous system and say, oh, this, this anxiety is a brain thing when, you know, our heart's racing, our gut is tightening, you know, all those things, it's, it's a little bit unhelpful because I don't think it gives the justice to how we can best manage things like what we would call nervous system dysregulation where we get stuck in the sympathetic state or in that shutdown state so I think we can do better for people to um, not only give them a better understanding of what's happening which in itself you know we like to say that the foundation of any successful nervous system work is the relationship or the allyship that you can cultivate with your own body because that is really what's feeding into this, the area of the brain called the survival brain where we detect if things are dangerous, safe or life-threatening. 
Yeah. So you've already mentioned here and there a couple of the signs that there might be some issues with the vagus nerve and the system and, you know, things like going into shutdown, et cetera. But how do we really know when something's wrong? Like when do you call it? Like when when does it kind of flick over? In Because, you know, we all feel anxious or shut down or have digestive issues from time to time. Mm-hmm. But at what point do you say to a person, okay, this is this is what we actually need to focus on. This is a vagus nerve problem. Mm-hmm. What are the signs? Mm, it's a good question. For what you would often see is a is a cluster of symptoms, given what we've said of all those pathways that it has and the roles that it play. So <clears throat> we would look at for some people, it would be that prolonged feeling of not being able to switch off so that we we, it would present as anxiety but but really a prolonged state of anxiety um, and certainly not being able to relax you know when we want to kick back for the end of the week and probably always being on alert so this is more looking at the that sympathetic state our relationships will often it will often show up as well so we might find ourselves if we are in that sympathetic state for prolonged periods becoming quite critical judgmental starting arguments um you know even that storming off where we're, we're more reactive um we can see as well as i said with the and as you said too jules with the digestive issues people who tend to be in this state gut motility can tend to slow down Um, and that's because of the vagus nerves role in contracting the smooth muscle walls of or or innovating the the smooth muscles of the gut to to contract and so often there'll be chronic constipation there Um, and really that insomnia is a big one that we see um, also so that would be a few clues some people will report that they have um, heart palpitations. We can see it with increases in changes in um, things like blood pressure as well. Um, that can go either way. And then if we looked at people who tend to, to be down in the shutdown stage for long periods of time, it can look a little bit different, but they'll tend to be chronically flat and, as I said, extreme procrastination just that sense of not being able to get the energy to do the things that um, are needed. So a lot of people who get diagnosed with burnout and think, oh, you know, there's just, I'm just not strong enough. We see that that is caused by a lack of vagal tone. And then there's prolonged um, activation of that sympathetic system, you know, so ongoing stress. And then eventually we drop down into exhaustion. Um, And that can look like as well withdrawing from social things, isolating. Um, One thing that's a big clue as well, you know, for if we are looking at somebody who is well regulated, you actually can tell if their social engagement system is working because you hear it in their voice. So somebody who is well regulated, their voice will have high prosody and that means there'll be changes in rhythm and pitch and this is something like parents do it intuitively with their babies where they talk in this mm. voice like that yeah. you know or you might do it with the <laughs> dog and that's that's a way to um to use co-regulation but we don't really know that's why we're doing it but that's why we are because it actually sends to somebody else cues of safety and when you read books to little kids, that's yeah. exactly what you do. <laughs> you use that fun, playful voice. So yeah. that we, we can tell it's not somebody talking in a kind of whispery voice. It's actually that variation in pitch and rhythm. And you'll hear, you know, for somebody else who is more in the state where they're anxious, there's lots of that monotone, but a breath every few words type of thing. So yeah. The voice is really interesting to listen to. But when we've spent a long time in the sympathetic state or that shutdown state, 
it's often very hard for people to listen because they the muscles of the middle ear actually change to detect the sounds of predators so if you oh think oh my god to, that's cool that's the coolest thing i'm gonna yeah. hear all day <laughs> <laughs> so when you're regulated you're primed to hear mid-frequency sounds which is the sound of the human voice and we're primed for connection but when we are in that survival mode for a long time it's very hard for us to listen. And people often tend to have that flat facial expression or flat effect. Um, the vagus nerve connects with the facial nerve, which is another cranial nerve that causes the eyes to, you know, how people smile with their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a sign of the vagus nerve working well. So, you know, there's lots of clues that you can, you can see when um, somebody will have low vagal tone, but, for me, I think the biggest thing is looking at the history before that. So, for instance, um, let's say in 2020, the bushfires went through um, in the Northern Rivers and then straight after that there was COVID. And then, you know, it might just take one more incidence of, a, of a, something with a personal relationship and if there isn't the period to recover between those stresses, that's where we often see low vagal tone. So stress isn't actually bad for us if we get to recover fully from it and it's not too much. You know, it's, it's actually helpful for us to have some stress to push us to take action. And also we become more resilient at having our nervous system move into that zone and then recovering. Yeah, but the problem comes is from a lot of people don't get that recovery, and so then it shifts that set point that I was talking about, like homeostasis. That shifts, so someone is more prone to being, we'll say, um, almost already at their stress capacity threshold because the vagus nerve isn't working properly, um, and yeah. that's that's where we'll see they spend a lot of time getting anxious over things that, you know, rationally they know are not such a big, big deal, but it, it, they keep, keep getting anxious. And that's exactly what you were just saying about like that onslaught of one thing after another, after the other is exactly what I was discussing with a client yesterday, who's actually in the Northern rivers. And, and I was asking how her, like her town wasn't in the floods but they were very close to towns that were. And mm -hmm. I asked her how she was going and how the people around her were going. And she said, look, honestly, now that, because it's, you know, six, seven months after the, the floods came through, she said, everyone just seems so flat. Everywhere I go, everyone's just flat. They've got nothing left to give. They've just got nothing. Like they're not up, they're not down, they're just flat. And that, that's mm -hmm. exactly what I was, when you were saying that, I was like, oh, my God, that's what's happened. Yeah. So the initial shock is often where, you know, you get that loss of vagal tone and then you run on that adrenaline or the sympathetic energy coming into your system. And that, you know, that's a really great system for giving us the energy to do what we need to. You know, when we've got to get something done, that's the system that comes in and we're like, right, let's go. But that isn't an infinite bottomless pit. So yeah. once we deplete that, then that's also the source of our vitality, of our passion. It's really our life force. And then once those two other states, we say, you know, the, let's say that, that those other two states of the sympathetic and also being in regulated state from the vagus nerve, if they get smaller, we've only really got left that other state, which is to, to fall back into that feeling, a sense of apathy. And the interesting part is following anything that's a traumatic stress. Um, for some people that experience may have been highly stressful, um, but when we call it traumatic stress, it's often a time where our survival brain interprets that, that we're helpless, which I would say, would be most people and, um, you know, there, there's a hopelessness with, with that, then it is likely to be traumatic stress and that leads to an, a change in our nervous system because our survival brain learns to be more on the lookout for danger. So 
it's a little bit like if someone broke into your house and you installed this really high-tech alarm system so that if it happened again, you'd, you'd find out. But then every time the wind was blowing or a fly went through there, it set the alarm off. Yeah. It becomes <laughs> a little bit similar. I had a smoke alarm at my house in Byron Bay that was exactly like that. <laughs> it didn't <laughs> know the difference be between a house fire and steak on the stove. Oh. <laughs> well, that's what can happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was just already on high alert somehow. <laughs> yeah. So you, the thing is, though, like you don't have to have been through like a huge trauma because I can I can already feel kind of the the guilt and the pushback, you know, when when we because we're talking about fires and floods and COVID and all of that, but like people can have things go wrong with their vagus nerve, and it didn't have to be some huge traumatic event, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think what we don't look at, but neurobiologically, it's the same, is that stress and trauma are on a continuum or like a spectrum. And I don't mean for this to dismiss anybody who's been through something traumatic in any way because that also needs to be acknowledged as a very difficult time. However, if we look at this as just being neurobiological, stress and trauma, it's just one end of the extreme. So whether we have something that's a smaller stress, we will still, the very first thing that will happen is the vagus nerve will be inhibited. And that's a good thing because it means that we are allowing energy to come into our system. We're allowing our heart rate to speed up. It's a little bit like, um, you know, say if you were going to run a sprint and your heart was already beating faster, that's actually quite good because, you know, you'd be ready to go. Um, (laughs) Like that adrenaline, it's the same thing. And then you know, we have that mobilization come into our system. But if we recover from the event, then we return back to our vagus nerve is already at back to its set point, And so is the sympathetic system. And just to give a bit of an analogy, which might make this easier to understand, you could think of the vagus nerve acting like a brake on a bicycle. And so say this is how it controls with our heart. So say you were riding a bicycle downhill, you would keep your hand on that brake just to slow your physiology or slow yourself down a little bit so that you didn't lose control. Our vagal brake is actually doing that. So from the brainstem to the heart's pacemaker, which we call the sinoatrial node, is part of the vagus nerve and it keeps our physiology Um, it brings our resting heart rate down to about, you know, 60, 70 beats per minute, give or take. Um, And it evolved more recently so that we could work cooperatively, we could collaborate. And people that did way back, you know, thousands of years ago, they thrived. So we have this vagal break that helps us to come back to regulation. But when we have relentless stress, so, okay, we go going downhill, our vagal brake is on, but say there's a stressor, we just relax the brake a little bit and then it lets a bit more energy come into our system to deal with the stressor or the challenge or whatever it is we're facing. But then we'd re-engage the brake and we'd slow back down to a speed where we could cope with going downhill and not lose control. But when we have relentless stress, it's like the brake comes off and it stays off. And then when we face a challenge, instead of it just relaxing a little bit, it actually is released fully. And that's what it's like to go into, you know, that fight or flight or um, into panic or for some people they just drop down into um, burnout or, or shut down, which is something that we may use as a response if in our past when we've had something really stressful happened, um, we couldn't take action. And so that helplessness or shutdown was what we used to respond. And then we actually learn how to respond by the future, by how we respond in the past. So it's not about it being 
you know, some big trauma, no. Um, whilst that is also very um, important for people, it's looking at, you know, okay, did I have, like what I said, with um, if we had looked at the fires and then there was COVID and then there was another event and say that all happened over a series of months, well, the vagal break is off and it's off and it's off. And so we start to develop these symptoms. Yeah. Would I be right in saying that there are physical things that can also set this process in motion? Because I've seen a lot of what looks like vagal shutdown and vagus nerve issues in a lot of my biotoxin illness people. So people who've had long-term exposure to mold or I've had one who was heavy metal client. I've had another one who had been over in Iraq during the Gulf War and was exposed mm-hmm. to chemicals there. Mm-hmm. Is, is that a thing? That's a great question. Um, we are now seeing how viruses and things affect the vagus nerve. So we could say from that, and there are some interesting, you know, case studies that are being presented now um, as research, but, you know, nothing that's solid in saying um, that we can assume that this is always the case because of there's not enough evidence. However, there's, there, is, there are case studies being put forward that show things like glandular fever, um, and other types of viruses can certainly affect the way that the vagus nerve functions. And probably the portal that we could look at that through is through understanding inflammation. So I would suspect from what you're saying with these clients, there would have been, um, you know. Huge a, inflammation, huge, yeah. like massive immune system response. Yes. And so the immune system and the vagus talk so closely, like, if we've had, um, you know, that chronic stress, well, it's actually the, the release of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine from the vagus nerve, which helps to keep the immune system in check. So when there's not enough of that, we will often see the immune system go a bit rogue, you know, so there'll be skin allergies and sensitivities and things. Yeah. Um, and there's certainly been the research to show that the microbiome changing is affecting um, the way that the vagus you know communicates and operates as well so the microbiome has a has a direct effect on the vagus too and so we would say that from you know from an inflammation point of view from a gut point of view but also looking at the heart so heart rate variability um, and what's happening with the beats at the heart that's a direct correlation to how that vagus nerve is is actually functioning. So we can look definitely from the body impacting on the vagus, and and it's sort of like a continual cycle, if that makes sense. Like yeah. maybe the vagal function dropped, then inflammation increased, then vagal function drops more. But the patients that I worked with with chronic pain, you were often they were often presenting with several factors. So it would be things like what you're saying. Um, you know, at, at that cluster of symptoms. And I, in the end, I think I had quite a few patients that would have things like Ross River fever and Lyme disease and, and yeah. other sorts of things. So it's, it's challenging for um, to be the patient where it feels like there's so many things wrong. But there is hope in knowing that, you know, you can have a, such a great impact on the vagus to have some improvements um, of course, that varies patient by patient. Yeah. So there's, there's so much feeding into this, isn't there? And, and when we start to look at like chronic inflammation and pain, there's so many different systems we need to work on. Yes, absolutely. I think um, for, for me, what I'm tending to see is that training that interoceptive system, so how people... Um, notice sensation. So, for example, in IBS, um, which has been reclassified as a by, by a number of organisations as a um, condition of gut brain interaction. Yes, <laughs> finally. <laughs> it's not as simple as like you know, don't eat this. A lot of that's to do with how sensations are processed, which is 
for me, that that's what I find really fascinating because um, pain is such a it's an experience that will be different for everybody. And I think that's where we can look at with stress and trauma. That is the same thing. So, for instance, Jules, you and I might go through the same experience and for you it might be like, whoa, that was full on, wasn't it? But, you know, for me that experience could be traumatic depending on my history, depending on my values, depending on my genetics. And I think it's... Depending on your microbiome. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Depends on what I, you know, how how regulated I already was. So it's it's just so interesting to to for people to learn this information for themselves and get to build as i said build that partnership with their own body and nervous system and really learn to listen to those those cues in the body that tell them oh i've shifted here oh i'm spending long time a long time in this state what's going on and and i definitely think you know there can be multiple practitioners helping one person like I think that's all really useful too yeah I think what you're doing is very complementary with what naturopaths do actually Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. which we kind of already knew but now I know why (laughs) (laughs) all right here's the big question are you ready I'm ready how do we fix it (laughs) it's such a good question I so the number one thing I would say again is you know people say what's the best tool I can use What's and one thing I can do that's only going to take two hours and then it's done and then I'm fixed? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew that. <laughs> but for the long term and, you know, not just for, for, for now but for somebody for the rest of their life, I would say learning to, to build that partnership with your nervous system, um, to attune to it. So this means learning to... Um, listen to what's happening in the body and understand what it means. And so without having a framework, you're not able to help shift um, your states. And this isn't cognitive. So it's something you need to be able to feel. And that's where I mentioned interoception before, how we learn to recognise and understand our body's cues and signals that is a system we can retrain. And that is something that I think people or everyone can benefit from. Um, and it's shown to have such a positive effect on our, on our, on our brain health too. Um, and then when we look at different um, tools for the states, I think what is really being shown to be profoundly um, Profoundly helpful for people is co-regulation, and you know we've we've sort of put down leaning on people in difficult times because it means you're codependent. But the one thing that can help shift your nervous system back to regulation when you're having a difficult time is being around somebody who's in a regulated state, because you will begin to mirror their internal world. Um, and that's through things like the social engagement system that we said. So there is this feedback loop that we can certainly um, get into with other people that helps us. And I'm sure you've seen it, Jules, when you're working with somebody and they come in quite anxious or wound up to see you, but you notice when they're leaving, there's a significant change. Absolutely. Yep. Well, that, you know, I wish I knew in university that that in itself is is just as powerful as the treatment um, because I think that as health professionals or friends or partners or parents or community members is something we can certainly work on giving to other people. Um, you know, of course, still taking care of our own self and recognising that doing that all day can be exhausting, but... <laughs> learning that we can again uh well we need to know our own nervous system to do that for other people um i touched on as well the voice and how helpful that is as a portal to um the nervous system so to we can see what state we're in yeah that we can also use our voice in the heat of the moment so things like slowing ourselves down you know when we're talking can really help to bring in the vagal break 
even um, extending our phrases. So that's a little bit like if you were breathing, doing deeper breathing exercises, but it's probably, I like things that people can do in the moment rather than, you know, sitting down and, and just trying a tool. Whilst that's good, I think what people really need help with is when the stress hits, how to how to regulate themselves. And I think things you can do in the heat of the moment are a little bit more useful. Um, they're some of my favourite, I would say. Yeah. How will people know if this rewiring is working? Yeah, it's a good question. So we often hear from students when they graduate from our program that what when they go to a situation that before they noticed they were definitely having those strong visceral sensations, um, they may then recognise as, as waves of, say, nervousness or pangs of nervousness, but it's not sort of a racing heart or, or clammy palms or a feeling like they can't breathe. So that's definitely one. Um, and then looking at if you were more prone to going into that shutdown state or um, tending to drop down into that burnout, there would be definitely be that increase in energy. But often people who go down into that state tend to dissociate from their body. So they find it hard to, say, feel at home inside their body. And this is where we will see with, with people as they improve regulation, they can stay more connected to the environment and the present moment as stressful situations arise. Um, there tends to be that whatever survival strategy we move into, it will take us away from feeling like we're in this moment. Like for some people who go into shutdown, they say it's like a fog comes down over them and they're separate from the rest of the world. Um, mm. And then we can look, definitely look at the increase in nervous system capacity as, you know, waking up and feeling like you've had a full and restful restorative sleep. Um, and for many of our students, that's the thing that they're, you know, just so grateful for to feel that change. Because if, you, if you've woken up from either of those states, whether you've been in sympathetic and kept waking up through the night or if you've gone, been spending a lot of time in shutdown, you might have slept for a long time but still wake up feeling exhausted. So sleep is definitely a big one. Um, the, the health of the gut, you know, so, so many people are experiencing that chronic constipation or chronic diarrhoea and that improves. So we're looking at this, yeah, the capacity increasing and so we will definitely see changes both in um, our physical health, but also in what we can cope with or what we can stay regulated and 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 step into, you know. So if some pe people were to think of, oh, I can't do that, it's too far outside my comfort zone, well, then this capacity increases to be able to even just do part of that, and that's wonderful. Yeah, that's awesome, and it must be so satisfying when you see those sorts of improvements with people because it also means that, then they've got the capacity to go out and enjoy the, their lives and to be more social and to do the things that they've wanted to do. Yes, absolutely. Like for a lot of people, there's a social anxiety as well that goes with it um, when they're feeling dysregulated or they want to withdraw. And I think that is definitely the most satisfying thing. And we will often have students, you know, tell us by the end that it was such a transformation because of the freedom that it gives you when you are not in a, not experiencing a dysregulated nervous system um, because it, it really does take over every aspect and it makes it hard to really be at home in your body, which I just think that that's a really difficult place to be in. Yeah, yeah, because it's the only place you've got to live. It's your exactly. own home. It's exactly. your only skin suit you're getting this time around. That's right. <laughs> skin suit. <laughs> um, Jess, this, this all sounds amazing. And I, I honestly, I, I love that you have a course now that you can do for people because it, it just makes it so accessible for everyone. Um, how can people find out about you and, and check out this course? What is it? Um, so our, our Vegas Nerve program is a six-week program 
And you can find all the details on that on my website, which is jessicamaguire.com. Um, it's, yeah, it's really designed to help people get back into the driver's seat of their own nervous system rather than feeling helpless and, yeah, that they're just in the back seat being taken for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what can people expect during this course? Like are, are there practical things? Are there exercises? Is there lots of videos? Like what, All of what? the above, yeah. So yep. we start out, the very first part is about that foundation, as I keep saying, the most important thing of building that partnership with your body um, and learning to listen to its cues and recognise the changes in state. We get started with interoception. But every week we have new, fresh resources. Um, there's also videos, audios, workbooks. Uh, it's really equipping you to feel that you can do this on your own rather than feeling helpless and that you need to um, look outside of you. So it's learning to cultivate this relationship with your own nervous system, which will, you know, it's a skill you'll have for life. Yeah. Awesome. I love that, getting people to do things for themselves so they don't end up reliant on anyone. It's so good. I think so too. Yep, I think so. Yeah. Can practitioners do your course as well? Because yes. I know I'm going to get asked. <laughs> so we normally have 50% would be. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, 50% practitioners and 50% of people doing it for uh, personal use. So we welcome both. And, um, yeah, we, we make it accessible to everybody. But there's, there's a lot that because a lot of people as health professionals say that they were doing it for their clients, but then they're like, oh, I got so much out of it for me. So I think it's really good because we want to, be, you know, know how to embody these resources before we give them to our clients. So, yeah, it's a great way to, do, to, to get started with that. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Now, I know that, I know, I know that when... Um, people listen to this the next thing they want to do is stalk you on social <laughs> media so you're pretty prolific on your business instagram account so um yeah where can people stalk you and get to know you yes please come and stalk uh, so our, <laughs> our nicely of course <laughs> yeah, nice stalking please um the instagram handle for our page is repairing underscore the underscore nervous underscore system Excellent. Excellent. Because, yeah, I do. I, I love the information that you're putting out there as well. It's like it's super helpful. There's some really good stuff. Thanks, Jules. Cool. Thanks, Jess. So, look, yeah, well, we will wrap up now, but thank you so much for everything that you do and, and for sharing all your knowledge with us today. I love how what you're doing is so complementary to, to what I do in practice as well. Like it just makes so much sense. So, yeah. Thank you so much for being a trailblazer and for, for doing this for people. It's so needed right now. Oh, thanks for having me, Jules. It's, um, yeah, I feel very passionate about it, particularly after the last couple of years, how challenging it's been. And we are seeing some great changes for our students. So that makes us very happy. That's so cool. I hope you enjoyed listening to Straight Talking Natural Health. If you liked what you heard, make sure you hit subscribe so that you're the first to know when new episodes drop. In the meantime, head over to my website at julesgalloway.com. There's all kinds of resources available there if you're keen to get started to live your best, healthiest, most energized life. When I'm not podcasting, I'm seeing clients one-on-one -on -one via Zoom. So why not book in and let's work together? I love helping my clients to heal from fatigue, anxiety, inflammation, gut problems and chronic health issues, to name just a few. All of this and more is available right now over at julesgalloway.com. That's all from me for the time being. I look forward to diving in with you again in the next episode. Bye for now.